<laughs> Emma Isaacs, welcome to Her Empire Builder. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, I am so excited. Like we just, um, you know, you were like, hit record, Tina, come on. <laughs> like, okay, I'm like, I just want to talk to you. How are you? It's been so long since I talked to you. I think like, I don't know, time is all gone, but I think like four years, three years, four years. It can't be that long. It's not possible. It's a long time. Well, it was before my trip and that was three years ago so yeah it would have been just before that I think oh, I before I ran snap. away from the world <laughs> we have to do we have to do better than that we can't let it go another three or four years I mean but what is the last couple of years like we ha- we can't count the last 18 months as any sort of um, barometer of no. human time right so yes. you take that away and it's only been like what a year that's fine that's it. That's it. <laughs> and I, I, like I know you're, you're in the US and you've been able to fly around I've just I'm getting laughed at at the moment because I've booked a retreat in April in the US and people are like you you will not be able to leave the country <laughs> I know I will I will paddle I will get in a little <laughs> kayak a canoe a canoe <laughs> damn right. it <laughs> um, oh. but you've been in the US is it five years now uh it's oh it's over six I think I think in th- this December it'll be seven I think that's right wow yeah or, or have I got that wrong I don't know six or seven it, feel, it feels like a while time for lies okay let's start there so why why did you leg it out of Australia over to the US yeah so um for anyone who's not familiar with my story, I'm what I call a career entrepreneur. I think I just made that saying up, but basically what it means is that I spent my entire career so far working for myself and being self-employed um, and have had some beautiful experiences as a result of, um, you know, that career path. So I started my first company when I was 18. Uh, we built a really beautiful little business with, with um, that it was a recruitment agency. So I had a lot of fun with that. Um, was invited along to a business chicks event when I was in my mid twenties. I said to the person who invited me, absolutely not, no way, not going to anything that calls themselves chicks. That's so derogatory to women. I'm a feminist. I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, not doing that. And she said, get over yourself, Em, and come along to this thing. So in I walk to this incredible room of you know a couple hundred women um there's a guest speaker there who i've i've got a notepad and pen i'm ready to write down all her wisdom and all her tips for you know running a successful business and she proceeds to take off her clothes and play the guitar there's a comedian as a guest speaker and um i just remember having the most wild you know it was so fun and being really um enthralled with this brand and and the way that they'd put a comedian on stage that would take off you know her clothes down to her underwear so I thought what what is this and it's fantastic and I ran back to my recruitment agency and I passed around my credit card and I said to everyone let's become members and let's buy three tables at the next event I've never seen anything like this before and the way I'd built my first business was really through networking and relationships and making sure that I was doing favors for people and making sure I was becoming memorable and trying to create an impact with everyone I met right so to find this kind of networking thing that I'd never heard of and fall in love with it was really um, special so we went along to the next event I heard the business was for sale I ended up running up to the lady at the end and saying I want to buy it and you know 15 years on I've um, really built it into what it is today and you know I'm still as excited and, and juiced about um, what we can offer the world as I was 15 years ago um, so, you know, after being in the business for probably a decade or so, I actually, the, the origin of this, this story is interesting. I'm not telling you this. I think you already know this, Tina, but I think I'm not telling you well, this. Well, the reason I didn't it. ask you for the origin story is I think it's adorable yeah. that you're like, for anyone that doesn't know my backstory, I'm like, mm, I don't I think anyone that listens to my podcast wouldn't know your oh, backstory. Of course, yes, of course they will. Of course they will. But, you know, one of the really the toughest parts of my gig, my, my job, and we have to get you along to this one day, but I get to run a leadership gathering or a conference on Necker Island every year, right? And I remember sitting up um, having breakfast and, you know, there were 25 of us there and Richard was there and we were sipping on our fresh coconuts and he was asking one of our members, you know, what's your business? And she was explaining about her business in Australia and he looked at her directly in the eye and he wasn't, he, he wasn't joking and he, he was very considered in his response. He just said to her, wow, like, is it possible to make money in Australia? Mm. And I just, I was kind of floored by that. I was like, wow, like that, that, that's quite significant. You know, for him, you know, business happens in North America, it happens in Europe. Um, you know, he does, has business 
in Australia, but it's this tiny little country or, or continent that floats, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere. And to him, that's not where you sort of make your mark, you know. And I, I didn't say anything, but that just sort of planted a seed in my little mind. And I thought, you know, I have been cruising and I have been doing reasonably well and have reached a level of success in Australia. And, um, you know, truth be told, if I'm being really honest with myself, I am not stretching myself and I'm not expanding in the way I'm trying to encourage everyone around me to expand. So that's why I packed up my little family. Well, I had four kids at the time and we hot-footed it to the US. Um, you know, we didn't really know anyone. My husband had an uncle who lived in LA, but that was sort of the extent of our, our networks here. And, you know, just really um, got to work. I mean, the, the short the short story, um, or long story short, is that it was a total flop and a complete failure. You know, I really tried to get business chicks off the ground here for a good probably 18 months before running entirely out of money yeah. and, um, and energy. And, yeah. um, you know, I was in a situation where my Australian business, I'd put a CEO into the company, I'd put a great leadership team, um, you know, really left the, the Australian operation in the best of hands. And so I was in this situation of I was, I was sort of bleeding them dry of cash. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I had to sit in the discomfort of making a decision, do I keep on going? And What was I said, the difference, oh, do you think, when you tried the US? Oh, so much. I mean, so much. People, people say that, you know, I mean, obviously we are culturally, we think we're culturally similar, you know, we speak the same language and, you know, we get all our pop culture from America and we travel to America all the time, but really it's, it's a very, in a lot of ways, it's a very, very conservative um, culture. And, you know, the, the, we had challenges on brand, on, on the name, obviously. Um, I mean, I just underestimated how much effort it would take to, you know, really get a business off the ground in the, in the US. And you have to be very serious about that. And I, I was desperately underfunded. I should have um, probably raised money to get it going. Um, a, a, ton of, a ton of lessons and mistakes. Um, yeah. But, you know, ultimately. And did that have to do with the super cryptic story of the partnership that you nearly signed in the US in the book that you talk about? super cryptic I'm like um, I'm reading it going well this is what cryptic. was that no that was that was a, it was a totally different thing it was a totally different thing. um yeah it was a totally different thing um but you know like I think I think there have been a ton of advantages and benefits to being here and you know in the process of all that failure and learnings and um misfortunes I've definitely found, you know, I, I love living here. I love the pace. I love the yeah, creativity. Yeah. I love the people. I mean, I know you've traveled here a lot and we've spent time together here, but, you know, I, I love the environment. I love the open-mindedness and, you know, so, so those things, you know, those byproducts have been really useful in my own entrepreneurial journey and in the lessons that I'm able to help my Australian business uh, learn from. So, yeah. It's, so is it's, that kind of when, when business tricks didn't work out in the US and you went, you know what, we'll stay here. Like, is that your forever home now? Or are you you still uh, seeing how you, I mean, you just built the most gorgeous house too? Yeah, we were lucky. We we um, bought a house just, and we bought a beautiful 100-year-old house um, just before the, well, a year before the pandemic. We moved in the month before we went into lockdown here. So that was all really fortuitous yeah. and, and amazing. So, yeah, we we have an amazing life here and we've carved out a beautiful lifestyle and, you know, the kids have American accents and, you know, we're very, um, you know, we're very, very settled here. I, I feel I feel very at peace and very at home here and I... I don't know, you know, I mean, you obviously always, if you, if anyone um, has had expat living experience, you know, you always are pulled to home and, and there's definitely been many moments of homesickness, but pre-pandemic, I was traveling back to Australia, you know, five, six, seven, eight times a year. Well, you even and managed to get back here in pandemic. And I'm like, I oh did. my gosh, she's like some magician. How is she coming, going back and forth? No, no, that, no, I only did, I did one trip, you right? Perfectly. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, I did the two weeks quarantine. I did that with my my right hand and um, my baby. The baby was, I don't know, how old would he have been? I think nine months or so, but it was actually, it was beautiful. It was like, how often do you get to hide from one-on-one on one with a sixth child? Children? <laughs> yeah, and have one-on-one on one time. Yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, I did. I came back to Australia for two weeks inside, you know, in jail in hotel quarantine and one week out. And um yeah, so that was good. That filled up my cup for a minute and, and I've been back here ever since. So yeah. I and look, I was meant to come back, as you know, for um, this new book and I was meant to tour and there was just no conceivable way that was going to happen. So um, 
look, we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen. November is the planned new date, so. Yes, plan your dates all in the calendar, all booked and everything. But again, you know, like we're at the mercy, right? Yes. And so this book's a new hustle, which I'm super excited about. Um, and I <laughs> did say to you before we hit record, I'm like, I don't think I should say that other, but I, but I will. I think it kicks winging its ass. Like I read it and I went, oh, this is good. It was right up my, I think because a lot of the things that you talk about in and the things that I, I'm working on actively at the moment and going, oh, I right. it's so much better than this. But I think everybody is all the time. So it's a really good, it's yeah. a really good concept. But first, the first question I want to ask you about it is, did you write it when you were pregnant or with a newborn? Either way is hard. Yeah, both, 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 both. So the story with this book, you know, I published my first in 2018. Um, you and I were having a beautiful conversation before we hit record on this podcast episode, but it's it's it continues to sell really well. It was the highest selling business book of 2018 in the whole of Australia was the the highest internationally after Elon Musk so he just beat me um there so so that was a really beautiful foray into writing you know and, and very unexpected and a beautiful surprise and um people continue to tell me that they get value from it so um was it when unexpected you- when you say unexpected was it unexpected or are you just yeah. hashtag humble <laughs> no, I mean you know me uh, I am hashtag humble but I I I <laughs> I also, no, it was a surprise. You know, I, I um, didn't know what I was doing at all. I mean, I still don't really know what I'm doing, but, um, you know, I gave it my best shot and, and you know, it resonated and I was really, really grateful for that, you yeah. know. So but I think the second time around, you, you you know what you're doing. You know, we we stayed with the same publisher and we're very grateful for their input. Yeah. I write every single word of my book so I don't, you know, there's there's no ghost writing or, or support like that. Um, I probably wrote over 200,000 words and that got down to about 60,000 the final wow, part. Wow, that's but, a lot of editing. Yeah, yeah, a lot of editing. Um, and probably, not probably, this was the third iteration of a book I wrote. So I, um, you know, it was it was a really interesting time because I, I submitted an entire manuscript whilst pregnant. Um, they edited and sent it back to me and I said, I absolutely hate this. <laughs> so I started again. Same and concept or totally different concept? T- totally different concept. Oh, can you I say mean, what it was or you might write it again later? Yeah, I, I honestly have like five or six other titles on the go right now um, and, you know, bits and pieces. And, and, you know, when I say I write every single word of my books, I absolutely do, but I do work with, um, you know, one of my team members who's a really phenomenal structural editor. So between me and her, it's this huge jigsaw puzzle of I will write a piece and then she'll um, file it and then she'll be like, that does not belong in the new hustle, that belongs in, ah, you know. So the there's next many, book. many other books coming out. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't enjoy the process of writing books at all. I find it completely torturous. I, I, Isn't I, it? It's one of the hardest well, mental things I think you could ever do. Yeah. I mean, I think as someone, you know, any entrepreneur who tries to sit still for a period of time and tries to, a lot of you know, we're so used to snacking on content and snacking on, you know, meetings and it's all just, you know, it's very, very hard to, to yeah. sit and order your thoughts and and it's it's quite tedious actually so I don't enjoy it but yes I I I do enjoy the um not the process I hate the process but I enjoy when people I suppose echo back hey I learned this and yeah. and I can feel like there's some impact there or hey that really helped me with this problem I'm facing or hey that really set me on a different path or hey and and, and that's a, that's a beautiful part and you know that from your writing you do get that feedback to and it's not about me I don't care if people say it's great that doesn't I have no interest in being validated for that but if they learn something and take something for their business journey then amazing that's that's awesome and I suppose I try and write um, you know I, I don't waste any words I try and get my point across really really quickly and um, you know people say that's that's great they appreciate that there's that, yeah there's no time wasted and I kind of make my point <laughs> quickly get on to and so episode. practically like energy wise because you're the mum of six children which is a lot of humans <laughs> how did you yeah. how did you get the the brain space and the energy to go you know what I'm gonna because you've got to really like you said focus for hours at a time to get the book done did you go in and out each day or did you kind of take a chunk and go all in in a chunk of time Yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think um, what my, I mean, what my process is, is to when the kids, so I have five, my kids range from 12 down to 15 months. I think the little guy is. So I'm lucky that my 
four, six, eight, 10 and 12 year old children go to school. So that's fantastic. So when they're out the door, I know I have to focus and get a good chunk of writing done. Um, I don't necessarily write in chronological order. I don't like, I don't go, okay, I'm up to chapter two and that's right. Chapter two, it's very piecemeal. And then I sit with my editor and I'm like, okay, we were exploring this theme. What do you think? And she's like, you need to give me way more, um, you know, meat to those bones or you need to give me a case study. You need to give me a story. You need to, or she'll question me and I'll then write. So it's really just, you're trying to get the work into pieces of a couple of hours at a time. And then, yeah, as, as I ramp up to deadlines and try, you know, the publishers sort of say, okay, it needs to be submitted by this date. I will go to a hotel. I often just book a hotel room and sit and try and, um, you know, write, not just in the daytime, but at nighttime as well. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's like anyone would imagine, it's stealing moments where I can. It's inspiration does come when I'm in the shower. So I'll, you know, reach out and write um, a note on a piece of paper, but it's it's just doing the best I can in every single moment. So it's, it's, yeah. it's not as if I go, I'm going to write a book in the next month and I'm going to sit down and go away and go on a retreat. It doesn't work like that. It's like steal the moment you know, get it out. I, I feel like you have to have a lot of discipline when you write. I, I don't know that I'm, I'm certainly not the best technical writer in terms of um, being that discipline because I like to feel my writing. I like to, you know, when I have a moment or a thought or a feeling, or often it'll be like, I'll go on a rant and then someone will be like, you need to write about that. No one's talking about that. So then I'll go, okay, great. And then I'll go and write about it. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what your process was, but I, I hazard a guess. It's very, very different for everyone. And, you yeah. know, when you do have a, have any children doesn't matter if it's six or two like you or one or whatever like it's it, it is stealing moments and and yeah. doing your best in and you've got to do what you've got to do at the time like my first book I actually went to Fiji for a week and just immersed in it and smashed it right. all out in that week and did nothing other than sleep eat and write <laughs> and right. I loved yeah. that but this time mm. I was in the pandemic so it wasn't an option and I found that yeah. way harder I'm going if I ever write right. a book again I will take great personal sacrifice and take myself off to Fiji <laughs> yes yeah it's very hard <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so how, what made you settle on the new hustle um, we went back and forth a billion times on different titles as I did with winging it you know the first two words I wrote when I wrote my first book was winging it by well okay five words winging it by Emma Isaacs and then I um, you know doubted myself and went back and forth with a hundred titles and um, you know came back to full circle with the, the initial one um, the new hustle I mean I think I've got a bit of an obsession with the word hustle and and I you know think it's very very outdated I think you know the hustling in the traditional sense definitely measures input and it measures how many hours and, and how much time you gave to a task or you know how many emails you wrote or how many meetings you had I could not care less about any of that and I think what the pandemic has certainly taught us is that you know the days of sitting at a desk all day and commuting to offices you know all, all of those practices and all of those disciplines that we come to accept as normal are, are no longer the normal right so we can create this new way of being we can create a new way of working we can throw out some of those old paradigms and really step into a new way of being right so you know I, I started thinking about hustling and how hustling is just such a word and oh, how yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's one of my revolting. least favorite like every time I hear yeah. hustle and grind what they sleep we work I'm yeah, like, <laughs> yeah it's, I know it's just no. it's, wrong. <laughs> it's so wrong I don't want to hustle so so really for me this is an, an anti-hustling book you know but it, it it's a nod to there is a new way of doing things there's a fresh way of doing things I think what the past 18 months has taught us is that we do have choice and that we do need to interrogate why we do the things that we do and that we do need to interrogate the way things have always been done and that ultimately it's up to us to choose, you know, what we want for our futures and what we want for our lives and, you know, to be proud and, and to have courage in stepping into that. So that's kind of how I landed on the title. Um, I don't know if it's... Yeah, so and what, what do you kind of see? So the reason I ask this is... So I know so many people we're all working through this at the moment where we kind of kind of switch into workaholicalism and have to pull ourselves back and remember mm -mm, just because you can or because you love like enough already. And I was having a Zoom yeah. call with a group of business girlfriends last week and we were all saying like what got us here won't get us there and going yep. we've worked really hard and really purposefully but burnout is like across mm -hmm. the board and going and the debate we were having which I'd love your stance on it is yeah, we resist the hard work and now we want to make better choices and longevity and not have burnout and adrenal fatigue. But could we have started like that? Like, would it have been possible or did we need that hard work at the beginning? So what's your distinction between like hard purposeful work and hustle and because I know you worked your tushy off at the beginning as well. I did. Mm -hmm. I old hustled my way into where I am today. <laughs> 
and I wouldn't change a thing. And I can only speak from my lived experience, you know, what I, what was required of me when I was, I mean, I was very, very young. So as I said, I started my first company at 18, right? So I had all the energy in the world. I certainly was nowhere near thinking about family or. I miss uh, that energy that we could do that. (laughs) well, it's not physically, biologically possible anymore. Yeah. And you're way younger than me, so shut up. No, I'm not. I'm like a year you or two. Are. No, you're not. No, you're not. Don't lie. I'm 42. How old are you? Oh, 37. Yeah, see, that, that, that's five years. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I don't believe that I would have gotten to where I am today without that level of dedication and drive and rigor and grit and, um, you know, I was just, I was just dogged. Like I I would not give up and I felt bulletproof and yeah, I I had the energy to do it. Um, And I will always forever be grateful that I didn't get that start while, while I had all those resources around me. Um, You know, what I will say from studying some of the world's most successful people and being able to spend meaningful time with them is at some point they have had to step into really, really hard work. And, you know, it's true when I say I'm yet to meet a a successful, lazy person. Like, you know, they just, they don't exist. You know, like, I mean, we, we talk about, you know, people who we admire and, you know, because I mentioned NECA before, like I, I watch Branson get up every single morning and play tennis for a couple of hours and then be in a hammock and do his, you know, and you think, wow, like I'm doing all this wrong, but you know, that, that can be really, um, that, that vision can be really misleading because there, there have been many, many, many decades of, you know, complete hard work and sacrifice and, you know, nose to the grind effort. So that's a really roundabout way of saying, um, you know, no, I don't believe I could have, I could be here today if I had not applied myself in the ways that I've applied myself in the past. Um, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't need to do it anymore. I, I didn't do it because I had something to prove, but I feel very, very, very comfortable in my own skin. I feel very, you know, proud of where One I'm of the best at. Parts are getting older, I think. It is. Just yeah. going, you know what? I don't have, like, I had a lot to prove to myself, not other people, but to myself. Was yeah. by that. And, and the last few years is a full shift of going, I don't care. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Zero fucks given. I honestly can tell less. I know. I I agree. I agree. I, I think um, you know, and again, you, you haven't even turned 40 yet, so you're such a baby, but there there is just such a beauty that comes with relaxing into the fact that, you know, just it's cool. It's it's yeah. it's exactly how it's meant to be. And I'm doing my best in every moment. And I mean sometimes I'm not doing my best in in some moments, but you know, overall I'm really proud of, you know, and I can look myself in the mirror and say, you know, you're you're doing your best and that's great. Yeah. And and no one need ask anything more of you. And I think that's a beautiful way to live. Yeah, totally. Um, now yeah. I read this line in the book that I want to read because I laughed out loud when when I read it and I was like, oh, it's one of those ones that you go, lol, but like I legit laughed out loud. Is It's about talking about Liz Gilbert. It says, Liz isn't shy about telling people that if she doesn't get back to their emails, it's not because she's busy. It's because she doesn't care. Doesn't care. <laughs> I know. Like, oh. <laughs> I know. But at what so point good. in your journey did you mm. learn that you couldn't be all the things to everyone and start letting go of other people's perceptions of you? Mm. Oh, I don't think you ever kind of arrive there and go, right, that's 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 old M and this is new M and mm. and never shall the two ever meet again. I mean, I, I think I worked really, really hard in the early days, you know, so maybe in my mid twenties of protecting my time and really understanding that time was my greatest asset and that I needed to work out how to maximize it. So I think I started playing around with that very awkwardly in my mid twenties, you know, um, being able to practice saying no to certain um, asks of me and, and, you know, whether it be an event to go to or if someone wanted me as their mentor or, or whatever that, that request was. So I, I did start playing around with it in my mid-20s. But, um, yeah, I think it's a practice, right? Like you, you practice it every single day and you find the courage to say no and you find the courage to, to create boundaries and to protect what's important to you and what matters. And, you know, I, I think it's it's something that I'm still working on and still practicing to this day. You know, there's 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 emails in my inbox at the moment that I haven't got back to because I have to say no to, and I'm still, you know, I'll I'll find the moment. You know, so I'm 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 not 
for a second saying I'm an absolute, like I'm, I'm pretty good at it. Like I have, again, I, I apply myself to the practice and I, I really have improved a lot, but I, you don't arrive at, at, at that. You know, you still, no matter who you are um, and how far you've come, you know, you, well, from, from my experiences, I want to be kind to people and, and do my best always. And, you know, it, it, it sucks to have to turn people down and say no at times, but ultimately if you want to be successful, you want to get ahead, you'd like time is it, you've got to protect it. And, yeah. And I yeah. think that's why that's why I loved that this book so much mm-hmm. is reading. I haven't quite finished it yet. I got it on Monday, so I'm like halfway through. Mm-hmm. And I'm just Maybe. because so many of the rules are around boundaries. And I think having boundaries and trying not to people please and learning the opportunities to say no to whilst mm-hmm. going, you know, I don't want to say no and cut myself off from things because we want to say yes and we've been working so hard and doing all that. It's one of the hardest things. And and one of my favorite Oprah quotes is big open heart huge fucking fence and <laughs> when she said it she said it while she was on tour here and I was like write that down I was like I yeah. love that um yeah. because to me like having boundaries was it was really hard to learn to do that and not feel like you were being an asshole or that people would be yeah. like gosh she's too big for her boots she doesn't want to I'm not worth her time anymore how yeah. how have you kind of coped with going it's okay to say no if someone else, like you're always going to say it with kindness and, you know, I've known you for long enough. Now. I think I've been a business chicks member. I tried to work it out the other day for like 13 years. Yeah, it's well over 10 years. Yeah, yeah it was, my, it was my first event. And so Amazing. I've seen you and you've seen me like through all of the different stages of all of the different businesses. And you do yeah. have that big, huge heart and that huge fucking fence. Like you do mm-hmm. that really, really well. But how have you, how have you managed? Because I see you at events too, where everyone wants a piece of you. Everyone's like, Emma, oh my gosh, you're lining up to talk to you. And you have to like end that at some point. How have yeah. you maintained that big heart while going, you know what, I need to protect my energy too, because I've got all of this other life going on? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. I, I think um, I think it's possible for the two to coexist. You know, you can be kind mm. and compassionate and giving and generous, and also have boundaries for yourself and and know that there's a space that's sacred and you need to protect that. And I actually think what we do is walk through life thinking that it's it's kind of binary. You know, it's like I can only be generous and kind and give yeah. all of myself, or I can be a total recluse and an introvert and and not give anything. Right. So it's it's the two can can marry and they can coexist and I just I, you know I've spent my life trying to practice this of, of of being generous but also being kind to myself you know and so I'm, I'm actually I'm actually I feel like just recently I'm getting even better just because I'm learning to be in stillness I'm you'll laugh at me and don't laugh at me but I'm meditating every single day and I'm um, you know I'm just I'm I'm really I don't know. I'm, I'm really still, and I'm really um, feeling the power of, of of you know that being okay and and yeah. whatever it is being okay. And I just love that um, practice. So I don't think it's been anything that's been entirely conscious. Like, oh, okay, I've got to give this much to myself, and I'm going to end the conversation and move on. It's just like mm-hmm. you know, the two can that they can live inside you. You can be a lovely, generous, beautiful person, and you know, protect yourself at the same time. And you know, I'm not saying for a second that I get it right, I often get get the kind of balance of that off kilter. But I just, you know, I think if the intention is there and you have integrity, mm-hmm. then people can sense that. You know, people sense that if you're full of bullshit or if, if you're genuinely trying your best to do, yeah, what you can and and yeah, I don't know. Does that answer it a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And I think I think that's good to to hear as well is that you can coexist those together because mm-hmm. I know that's the big fear from all the women that I work with in going, if I say no to this, like what will they think of me? And yeah. will they think I'm horrible? Like it's, it's always the fear. And so women end up saying yes to everything and then there's nothing left for themselves at the end of the day. And it's not just a fear, it's actually a reality, right? So, and, and I can say that from the point of view of working with American women and working with Australian women, you know, there's a there's a cultural comfort over here of, um, of, of boundary setting, of saying no, it's, it's, that there's no emo, there's no emotion. It's like, okay, cool. You know, like, you know, do you want to have lunch with me? Oh no, I, I'm no, no, I don't. I can't or whatever. Like, great. It's not like, oh, she doesn't like me. <gasps> what do you mean? What what else is on that's more important than me? It's just she said no. Okay, cool. And you move on. Yeah. So it's it's a very different culture in Australia. It's a lot more emotional and we're in our heads and we overthink and we analyze and we overanalyze and it's, you just got to let that go. You know, 
I don't know. I don't know yeah. what it is. I don't know. And no, I'd never yeah. laugh at you for meditating. I love meditating. I meditate no, I every day. I and I can't be laughed at at the moment because I'm newly convert to Peloton. And I'm like, great. So into it. And I'm like, I deserve great. to be laughed at. That's great. That's yeah. awesome. The Peloton is awesome. I don't do that at all, but um, I have an exercise bike that's on my balcony. It's not the and same, I, It's not the same. I know. I know. I know. Peloton is a real deal. It's so good. I'm well like, like in the cult of Peloton. I'm like, yeah, I'm there. Cool. <laughs> I love um, it. Okay, so I want to ask you about social media as well because so many of the rules that you have in your book and so for people you've got, is it 70, how many rules? 70, 77. 77 rules. Um, but a lot of them do like weave into boundaries and protecting energy and how you get more done in less time and more effective and, and focusing on what's important for you, which I love. Um, and one thing that I find fascinating about you is social media in going, you use social media when you need to and then when you don't, you're like, you know what? It's not part of my life. And I'm like, gosh, she nails it. How do you do that? <laughs> do I? Oh my gosh. You need to talk to my team. My team think I absolutely categorically do not nail it. <laughs> I love it because you use it for what you need. Like when you need to talk about the book or when you need to talk about an event, you've got it there. And then other than that, it's just left. Yeah. I, I just have no interest. I, I think it, it comes back. I have, I have no need to be for anyone to like people don't have no clue of what goes on, my, on in my life. And yeah. I, I don't feel the need for them to, to, I don't know. It's like, there is so much stuff that is sacred and private to me. And it's between me and my family and my dear friends. And it's, it's not for public consumption. It's like, just, it's, I don't know. I think we give so much of ourselves and, and, and we don't save. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a sacred question to me. I don't know. I just, I just don't, 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 need, don't feel the need to share everything. I don't share anything. In fact, I share like 5% of my life. And yeah. people said to me, oh my gosh, if people actually knew what was going on in your life, like you, they would lose it. Like they would actually not be able to cope with what happens in your life. I'm like, well, that's great, but I'm not living my life for other people. You know, I'm living yeah. my life for me. And I don't feel the need to sh share that and express it on social media all the time. Mm. Um, I don't go to social media. I don't numb myself through scrolling. I don't do that at all. I mean, I, that's not to say I haven't in the past, but you know, that doesn't go for just social media. I don't, I don't watch TV. I don't definitely don't want to at the moment. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I would, I don't know how we have two TVs in this house and I don't know how to turn on one of them. And I like, I don't even think it works. So, you know, it's, it's just not, it's just not a part of my life. Um, and I think that has come from, this weird obsession that I have with time and how we spend mm. it and the study of that. So I do try and be mindful with what I'm doing in every moment. And if I find myself, like if I, let's say if I post them on Instagram and then I like go to scroll and then I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Stop, yeah. stop it. Why am I doing this? Stop, stop. And I just, yeah. I, I do, I am pretty disciplined like that. I'm pretty, I'm a bit like you, a bit hardcore with my discipline. So I can just yeah. put it down, turn away. And I was saying this before I was speaking to a friend of mine, like I can go for two days without knowing where my phone is, you know, it's, um, it's weird, but I have so many kids that they will take it and, you know, be watching something and then they'll put it in the toy box or they'll put it under a pillow and I just won't have my phone for two days. And I know I can use find my iPhone if I really, really want to, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's cool. I don't, I don't need my phone. And it, you know, it's that, again, it's not, I don't want to pay myself as this person who has not had addictions and, you know, being glued to my phone. And I certainly use it as a distraction from time to time, but it's just social media is something that I've got very, very clear about and it doesn't make me feel good to be scrolling all the time so I just I try not do it I love so. that so what does your day-to-day -day look like now with how involved are you with the Australian operations of business chicks are you have this changed since the pandemic yeah I mean it has it's more changed because our CEO um, was on her uh, maternity leave or yeah. parental leave um, so you know for those six or so months I was quite hands-on and, you know, we needed to be, I mean, a huge part of our business was swept away um, when all the restrictions came into place. And, and I think you've read this part in the book, you know, for me, it was, it was a fantastic opportunity to return to being like the scrappy entrepreneur. I was, you know, I, I grew up in business being right. Like just the person who would not schedule things and would just be in the moment and would try and read a room and try and understand what our members needed. And, you know, met them at that level. So um, for me, it was fantastic for a lot of the people in the team who like to schedule and like to plan everything out six months in advance, you know, having all that thrown away and me yeah. having a director saying, 
It's not possible. So stop yeah. talking about it. We don't know. We don't know what, what's happening next week, let alone in six months' time. So we have to change that way of working and be here and be now and, and um, yeah, kind of look at things that way. So, um, yeah, so during the pandemic, it happened to coincide my CEO's um, parental leave. So I was very, very hands-on. I was also 400 weeks pregnant during that time. Um, it felt like, um, so that was all good. And, but I've, yeah, stepped back a little bit more now that she's back in the seat and doing a fantastic job. Um, but, you know, and, you know, this Tina and you and I have talked about this before, but like in a lot of ways, I feel very, very privileged and very grateful to be living like the entrepreneur's dream. You know, I have a business that I don't need to be operational in and, you know, it um, does well every month and, you know, affords me the space to think of other things and to, yeah, just work at a different level than being, you know, always on every single day. And so, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm very, very. Which working. is, it is the dream. And mm -hmm. I also know you're always working on something though. Mm -hmm. What yeah. is, what's the next big goal for you? And when we used to be able to see each other all the time, I know you always spoke about seven kids. Is there a seventh coming <laughs> on? Because no. you've been like pregnant or breastfeeding for what, 12 years. I know when you put it like that. When you put it like that, it sounds like a lot. Um, no, there won't be a seventh child. I don't. I think it would be entirely um, unreasonable. I think, I don't know. I mean, it's been a really interesting time not being able to be distracted with all the things that we used to distract ourselves mm. with, right? So, uh, you know, I alluded to it before, being able to kind of have a break and, and go to Australia for a week or two um, was a way that I coped with the pace of um you know my life as a mom of six kids and the businesses that I built um so when you take away those kind of distractions and you're left with whoa this is the enormity of the task in front of you and now go home imagine, school like <laughs> breakfast time breakfast is crazy man yeah. breakfast, it's um it's crazy, but we're we're we 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 vibe well you know like a lot of my friends come over and they're like I know like I have friends who have two kids and their houses are more chaotic than this, you know. So it's it somehow mostly kind of works. Um, but yeah, breakfast is breakfast is fun. I mean, they're, they're back in school now. We had the tremendous summer break of 11 or 12 weeks and they're back in school now. So the two big ones are out the door first and the three next ones go to the same school. Is that right? Yeah. And then um, the little guys at home. So it's actually, it's, it's, it's okay. It's fine. I don't even know what your question was, but we're talking like, about. What's, what's the next big goal that you're working on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sort of, I don't know. I, I think I've changed my wiring like that. You know, I'm not really, I don't know. I'm not really I like remember that. when we were in Uganda <laughs> and yeah. we were talking and you, we were talking about plans and I was going, okay, this is my 10 year plan. And then this is the five year and this is the three year. And then this is broken down into one year. And you <laughs> you're like I was like oh god fucking I'm boring <laughs> you, know? you don't know <laughs> and you're right I didn't know <laughs> but I've stopped being like that so much because I know that like if if when I was like that I missed a whole lot of opportunities because I was so tunnel visioned on no this is just where I'm going not looking sideways at anything but then I missed all these amazing things so I'm a lot more bendy now <laughs> So I know that's where you're coming from when I'm like, okay, Emma, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm even more relaxed now than I was perhaps mm -hmm. back then. I mean, I really, and we, you know, there's a bit in the book I talk about this, you know, and it's, it's, it's care of our friend Liz Gilbert, you know, and she says something along the lines of, you know, let your life surprise you. And I, I love the idea of that. I love the idea of, um, you know, the not knowing, and I love yeah. the practice of trying to be, in the uncertainty and I think the pandemic was a really great uh, litmus test for a lot of us you know to, to relinquish that control and to really try and step into that the enormity of um, the not knowing and, and I, I love that I've been practicing that for a while so I don't really have I don't really have a huge you know next goal I mean I've got lots of projects in the works um, but I'm really content and I'm really happy and that's not to say I'm not ambitious but I try and go about my business um, you know in with ease and grace like we, what we talked about before just ease and grace ease and grace and you know I know and I trust that opportunities will come up and I know and I trust that I'll be able to meet them or I'll be able to say no to them and um, I love that I just I love being able to live my life that way and for me it, it brings a certain level of I don't know of, of, of comfort 
And um, yeah, so I will often say, you know, more of the same, just more of the same. Yeah, I love that. This book is a work of art. I love it. I really, really do. And I think it's, it's going to be so helpful to so many people, no matter what level you're at. It's very thought provoking. Like at the end of every little rule part, it made me stop and go, huh, huh hmm. how am I going with that one? Like, am I doing that okay? <laughs> do I need to change that? Like it's, it's really okay. good. Yeah. So thanks, awesome. Emma. Thank you. No, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Love you. Love you. <laughs>